I guess it's kind of a misnomer because it's not really new analytics. It's kind of stuff that you're doing already. Because web governance is kind of like about managing the operations, about managing the activities and the resources needed to run a website. And as part of that, you need to keep track of, well, how you're doing that. And you actually already do that because you're probably talking to people on your team, you're looking at things like GA or analytics tools. You just keep seeing if things are going to be able to deliver to a team that level of quality. But the good news is that over the recent number of years, a great variety of new tools have come up to the market that make that a whole lot easier. And as websites have grown in complexity, grown in sophistication, grown in scale, we are relying more and more on these tools gives insight of what's actually happening on our websites. Because as complexity increases and scale increases, you tend to get further and further away from your site. It's more difficult to see what's actually happening. You see the impact of the decisions you make and how that relates to things that actually occur on the website. So I call it the new analytics because this is something that was going to come onto your radar screen a lot more in the next few years. But when I mention the term analytics, it's I guess natural to think of web analytics, GA, site news on analytics, and other tools for tracking online performance, <clears throat> particularly around things like design, content marketing. So in many ways, there's a direct line between web analytics and those core disciplines. Because when you see something going wrong, perhaps um, in your analytics, so maybe you're seeing not as many visitors as you, as you expected, or maybe behavior is a bit odd, or you're not seeing quite as much engagement as you'd hoped for, you kind of track back from there and see, OK, well, what's going wrong? Maybe you'll find that. Well, it looks like our initial understanding of the user's needs was off, and so that design decision we made, although we made it with the best intentions, we just got it wrong. So now we need to revise it and do something different. But what if when you're tracking back and you go back to your initial understanding of user's needs, you say, well, no, actually, that, that intro, we got that right. I mean, actually, our design decisions are, are pretty okay, so what's gone wrong here? Then you discover by doing more investigation, by auditing your system, that actually it wasn't your initial starting point that was wrong, it was actually how things were implemented. So maybe the people you hired or the people on your team to do to actually expedite the work haven't delivered. Maybe they're late, maybe they're doing the shoddy work. Well, how would you know? Web analytics is only one indicator. There's a lot more indicators we should be looking at. That's what we're going to be exploring today. So really we're going to look at three things. First is web governance and how to recognize the well operating web governance systems, what its key attributes are. Secondly, we're going to look at the analytics of governance. They're the indicators that and serve as a dashboard, an early warning system for when things might be going wrong in the team. Then thirdly, we're going to be looking at the border trails. So if you see those early warnings, what are the steps you need to follow to identify the isolated issue and help we solve it? And then finally, we're going to look at one other thing, which is rather than when you're being reactive to problems, to use the analytics of web governance, so analytics is coming in many new technologies, to triangulate those, actually come to better resource and better operational decisions. Because while a lot of innovation has gone into consumer technology over the last number of years, that finally is starting to come to the back end of web management. So we have web analytics for a number of years, people are kind of comfortable with that. We have tools like Cyber Group offers for technical monitoring for QA. But a lot more tools are coming up to the market. Some ones I've just seen more recently are kind of uh, tools that assist you with manual testing. So rather than manual testing and doing everything in Word documents, it allows you to record, kind of like the old tracking, but more sophisticated than that. You have other tools which track online readability, so the quality of just writing on your website. And then there's other tools which are probably familiar with, like SEO mods, tracking the quality of SEO on your website, and loads and loads and loads of other stuff, and more emerging all the time. It's by putting the data together from all those different systems and creating, hopefully, in the future, some type of dashboard, it will enable you to hone in on web governance as a potential source of issues um, as regards quality of your online experience of your operational experience to give to internal stakeholders and overall for your organization. So we're going to look at three things, so a little bit about me just to start off with. We're going to talk about defining web governance, that's the end of the month and then the analytics themselves. So as we mentioned, I'm going to have uh, online technology in mind. I guess I first went into web governance about, about 10 years ago and really my I have some management experience of I'm looking after smaller sites of the staff, but it was around 2003 that was appointed webmaster of Ireland's largest firms, about 10,000 employees. And um, at first, I had to look after quite a wide range of sites. So a large corporate website, an intranet, group websites, lots of web websites, and other online issues. Part of the issue I had at the time was, oh, there's so much complexity here. How do I 
you know, know what to look at and what not to look at, and who's in and who's not in, and you know, how do I manage procedures? So I went looking for advice on it. And back in 2003, there wasn't much advice. There was very little literature. So I started going to conferences like this, training conferences, and reading whatever uh, writing was available, and then pulling the best ideas together and started writing articles about governments on my own website, and on the list apart, and then released that book way ahead of its time back in 2006. And at least I got it off my chest. Um, and in that was kind of a nascent model for web governance management. Since then, I've kind of had opportunity to revise. I've been doing a lot of consulting work over the last number of years, um, particularly around content uh, strategy and uh, in more recent times because it's kind of growing in popularity and exposure in governance directly and exclusively. And so I've just had the opportunity to update my model. And so recently I've entered into the project. So I include on that basis. <coughs> so anyway, let's get into it and define web government. So who here would like to have a start and say, what well, I'm really getting away about what web governance is. Who wants to have a day? Okay, well, I pick something like in a classroom of well. <laughs> <laughs> when we talked about it outside, but I told you the answer is uh, hell. You can't remember. No, I'm sorry. Okay. It's how we manage websites run and organize and our teams in WhatsApp groups mm -hmm. talk to each other communicate to make sure the overall management of the whole process is effective. That's pretty good. Yeah, okay, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, there's actually a fair bit of debate about how to define web governance. So that's kind of my own definition of yeah, governance. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> That's kind of my own definition of governance. Um, and I guess in terms of the debate, there's two ends of the spectrum. There's those who take quite a wide approach, that's me, and then others who take quite a narrow approach. That's kind of reflective of the debate within IG governance itself. Um, you might be familiar with somebody called Lisa Welshman. She writes a lot about uh, web governance, and she takes quite a narrow approach. She would, she would say, web governance is about the decisions we make for online, and it's how we make those decisions and the people involved in the process. That's all. It's not how we do it. Once I make the decisions, that's operations. I don't care about that. It's just about the decisions we make. And that's why, like I say, that reflects many people's definitions of IT governance as well. But from my own point of view, it's more than that. There's two reasons. Firstly, kind of reflecting my own experience coming into website management in kind of an anger like 10 years ago, that there's a great amount of complexity. So it's not just about the decisions that we make for the set of rules by which we do online activities. The activity is, well, how do I know what to do? You're telling me all these policies and regulations, but how does that translate into on the ground management? And I see all these activities, I see all these people involved, I see all these resources and tools and procedures. Which ones are in? Where do I draw the line around and say, this is, a, this is web and this is not web? <clears throat> so that was my challenge, Matt, and that's why I went for quite a broad approach. And secondly, when I talk to people like yourselves, People don't come in and say, Shane, I have a web governance issue, i.e., I want you to tell me what our rules for online should be. No, they say, Shane, a web governance issue, we're team around each other's throats, we have a terrible relationship with our stakeholders, I'm not getting the budget, my senior executives I'm reporting to doesn't care, and I don't even know what I'm supposed to do because I don't have a background in web, I'm not sure how to manage this, please help me out. And again, that kind of implies people want a broader approach. So the definition I adopt is that web governance describes everything we use control of a website or manage a website and control in a way. Now I could see by saying everything that that could be quite unmanageable or almost too wide. Because as you know, there's rules and rules of uh, activities involved in website management from day to day, publishing and QA into longer term strategy and development, and lots of uh, resources need to support that activity as well. But funny enough, when you get right into it and you drill right down, you find that you can describe all of that, everything you would go in in terms of just three components. We're going to explore those now. <clears throat> so this is what I call my web governance framework. And this has been used and tested in quite a variety of situations. And it seems to be quite robust. And I guess it has a number of advantages. First, that it can be summarized in one illustration. So that makes it easy to communicate. So if you want to talk about governance internally, you don't go, well, it's a bit of like people do this and that. No, here's just the here's the thing, and here's the bit we're talking about there. It's about leadership for us. You can actually point out the area you're talking about. Secondly, it's comprehensive, so it includes everything to do with online management. 
than 30 at scale when you store that in your own. Basically, it means that no matter how big or small your online operation, no matter what it's about, no matter what the subject matter is, this model can cover. Okay, so it's composed of three elements. The first is activity. So the activities are all those things you need to do in order to manage your website. <clears throat> at the high level, we have leadership, so that's setting the rules for development. That's things that you do maybe once a quarter or a longer term basis for adding significant new elements of content or creating a new site from scratch. Maintenance is day to day operations, and then infrastructure is the technology on the line at all. And then to support those activities, we have four key resources. The most important of which is people, then we process those tools and budget. And then in the middle, we have this concept of website scale. So let's get into a little bit more detail. Okay, so website scale is essentially an idea of when somebody says to you, well, hey, how big is your website? You go, well, you know, it's, you know I have 20,000 pages, but then you discover it's like only one line on each of those pages. It's not really a great measure. Or you say, well, I have, you know, 40,000 gigabytes of data. And you go, well, you know, of what, though, a lot of it may be good, you don't know. There's no really good measure of the size of the site. So rather than just talking about the size, I kind of expand it about to create this concept of website scale and there's three parameters, complexity, size, and activity. So complexity is kind of the baseline of a site. So it's about the technology used for hosting the site and for delivering more content. So I describe that as there is for each of these three parameters, three levels, like basic level, mid level, and then high level. So the basic level of complexity is like the brochure website. So my own website, digitally.com, it's just brochure. It's just a web server, okay, to the internet, plain text, a few images, downloads, very, very simple. Uh, Mid-complexity site will be one that's kind of dynamic, so maybe uh, it, it uses server-side scripting into a database for producing lots and lots of content, so a lot of apps are operating on that basis. And then thirdly, you have a highly transactional, a highly complex website, so that's one that that was login, personalization, online financial transactions, kind of the whole gamut of everything that you can do on a site. So that's a very, very complex, that's one very complex uh, website looks like. <clears throat> then add to that then, the next layer of is website size. So again, getting back to this idea of, well, how do you define size? Pages, data, data transfer, there's no very good measure. So rather than that, what the measure of the moment is effort needed to manage core content from production through to maintenance. So let's say you've got uh, a site with 10,000 pages, plain text content. Relatively unsophisticated, you can just write it, that's fine. <coughs> then you can easily compare that to another site that's got very sophisticated content, but low volumes of that content. So let's say it's video or audio content. Despite the fact that one's got very low volumes, it's very sophisticated, and the other's got very high volumes, very unsophisticated, don't need the same amount of effort to maintain it. So let's say it's about you know, three full-time equivalents to manage that. So despite the fact that they're very, very different sites and very, very different types of content, the actual effort needed to manage the whole content is the same. So that's another good indication of size. So the type of size uh, we're talking about here for small scale sites, one to two people, or full-time equivalents for managing core content, three to them, five to eight, for mid-scale, if you're doing you know, 10 onwards or that, for a that. And then finally we have activity, which is kind of the final layer on the cake, which is We've got the technology, and we've got a content on top of that, and then we have activity, which is a measure of the audience reach, traffic, and engagement on the site. So you might say that a small-scale site doesn't have that much traffic, everything's fine, and all that engagement, maybe for people don't need comments at all. Then as you ramp up, and you get perhaps you know, you're more sophisticated in your architecture, you start publishing more and more content, and more sophisticated content, you start reaching a wider audience, and then our audience starts to react and engage with you. Well, greater activity implies greater engagement, which implies you have to do more work to maintain that. You need somebody to manage feedback, respond to emails, you know, monitor comments, uh, moderate forums, all that type of stuff. So in short, each of these, as each of these uh, parameters of website scale grows, essentially all the activities of online management increase in granularity and therefore implies more people, more skills, kind of processes, and more budget. Okay, so that's the core of website scale. Then we look at the activities. So the four activities can be broken down into subtasks. <clears throat> and again, each of these subtasks, no matter how big or small your site is, no matter what's that all is happening. It's just that on a very small website, it's kind of, you know, hey, I'm the, I'm the web guy. You do all this. If you're a one man or one two or a two-person web team, you're doing all that. It's just it's squashed into that small number of people. As the site grows and scales, so it becomes more sophisticated in its architecture, grows in size and rows and engagement, 
all of these start to break out. You might find that technology first breaks out, then you know, maybe design and content break out individual, individual skill sets, and you hire people specific for those. And then again, as you increase more in scale, more of those individual paths start to break out. So you hire specialists who just do that, somebody who just does testing, somebody who just does build, which is development, somebody who just does design. <clears throat> but nevertheless, no matter how big or small your site is, those four primary activities <coughs> and subtasks remain the same. And then we get into the resources needed to support that. So these essentially are the things you need to invest in to make sure that these things can happen. Because without this, essentially, by definition, nothing can happen. The most important of which is people again. And again, if you're you know, looking at your governance model, the number one thing to focus on getting right is people. So hire good people, and kind of everything else has a, a way of sorting itself out. Because good, pe good people tend to find a way, even if they don't have great tools and technology, you know, they'll find some freeware and shareware too and get, get stuff done. But anyway, the key parameters of it, or sub elements within each of those are so if you're considering what, how to invest in people or how to arrange and configure people in your governance model, the first thing you start off is start off with is skills. So there are well the, that defines the expertise I need to manage the content and technical aspects of my site. Then when I identify the skills, well, how many people with those skills do I need? Then how do I allocate roles and responsibilities to them? And then how do I structure them into formal teams and formal reporting systems? Then how do I find the processes that are their that are default? So standards and documentation and procedures, and then equipping them with the tools and technology to get the system to get the, the job done. And then finally, kind of budget to support it all. From time to time, you know, you might go through a significant development cycle, so you put in place for that, maybe you have to hire rate. Uh, contractors on a short-term basis, so you know that's important. And of course, it opens everything else as well. So those are the three elements of the governance model, and the way it works in terms of kind of you know moving the lever is to arrive at some kind of understanding of what your government governance system itself should look like. Those are these three steps. So first, you measure the scale of your site. So how big is the and complex is my site today, and how is that expected to change over time? So if you're starting to think about web governance, so well, how much should I, do I invest in this, this site? How many people do I need? And you know, how rigorous should I be in terms of processes and the type of tools that I should be? Just be shareware or should I invest in the CMS? First thing you need to gauge in your own mind is well, how big an online operation is going to be. <coughs> so if you look at the scale both now and down the road, from that then that will imply what the granularity of the governance activities are going to be. So if you've got a big scale site, uh, all these four activities will break down into individual subtasks quite quickly. So a large scale site is going to have a lot of publishing happening on complex content, maybe on an ongoing basis, which implies you need a lot of people with specialist skills to look after. <coughs> which brings us to the resources. So as I said, the more granular become the four activities, the more sophisticated and expensive essentially become the government's resources. <coughs> okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, this is my own website, and it's uh, me and our web governance, obviously. Um, in terms of its scale, it's low levels of content, about 100 articles on there. And in terms of traffic, pretty low traffic, unfortunately, but you're going to change that right. <laughs> and then basic technology, it's essentially just web server. I kind of manage it myself. And indeed, for everything on the site, I kind of manage it myself because the activities that arise as a result of such a a low uh, scale site aren't that complex at all. It's that uh, they're relatively simple and they occur in three, which implies that, you know, leadership, I kind of said what I want to do in a development. Yeah, I do something significant probably every six months and, you know, kind of plan it myself. Maintenance, sure, I look at it every day, look at the traffic and you know, maybe publish an article on the blog every week or so, or the technology again kind of looks out itself. So, kind of, kind of blocky activities, not, not very finely detailed. Um, which implies that the resources to support that pretty unsophisticated, although I'm considering myself a reasonably sophisticated person, and when they're cheap, again, I'm considering myself cheap, but it's like, as I improve that, that and, and require a little management. <coughs> Imagine that's me there, or what I used to look like in years and days. Um, I follow relatively informal processes. The tools I have are uh, unsophisticated and cheap. It's basically freeware and shareware tools. And the budget, well, it's really actually just to support the technology. And the rest is just my own client. So I don't hire anybody to do anything for me to do it myself. But let's contrast that then with a website at the far other end of the scale. So 
both from my code like UK, which is some experience on. <coughs> okay, in terms of content, they produce huge volumes of very sophisticated content on an ongoing basis. So they never stop publishing, they're constantly publishing on many different platforms. In terms of traffic, they get well over uh, a million visitors every month. And in terms of com complexity of their architecture, I mean, you name it, they've got it. So they've got a fully resilient architecture spread all over the world type thing. Um, multiple layers, logging, personalization, financial transactions, they've got it all. <coughs> what does that mean then in terms of the four primary activities of governance? Well, it means they're very sophisticated, they're very granular. So each of those four elements and the subtasks we saw before, they have broken down the band into each um, individual subtask. And essentially there's a person or numbers of people kind of responsible for each area. So publishing will be a big one. If lots of people, specialist authors, you know, journalists who write just for them and publish on many different platforms. Obviously, got loads of developers, loads of designers, loads of technology people, uh, testers who only job is to test the website, etc., etc. And so, highly granular activities, and they occur very frequently. And therefore, to support that, lots of people with specialist roles, very well defined responsibilities, know exactly what they're there for. The focus really just on that, and they've got well defined processes, so everybody knows exactly. What they should be doing, and importantly, how they should do it with you know, workflows, going out and video, etc. Um, technology, again, very sophisticated. You know, they may even have slightly improved. That's just how well they're. Um, joke. <laughs> and uh, lots of other sophisticated tools, and then like obviously cash. Lots of cash. Um, so that's how we see uh, the two ends of the spectrum in terms of scale. Then the final interesting thing about this model is that we can use the concept of website scale to make comparisons between the governance models of sites of different types. And so despite the fact that these two sites, Macmillan, which is a charity, a non-profit organization, and VHS, and an online retailer, are very different industries, very different objectives, and sometimes different content, because they are very similar in terms of website scale, we can make a prediction of, you know what, their governance systems are going to be quite the same. So they're both, in terms of complexity of their architecture, kind of about the same. They have some personalization, login, and some transactional services. In terms of size of their content, we actually get the same number of people need to manage or to create, manage, and you know, uh, maintain content over time. Despite the fact that their content might be different, like one, you know, these guys produce a lot of plain textual content, but a lot of this stuff is like imagery and design and stuff. <coughs> despite those differences, you see approximately the same numbers of people. And then in terms of activity, they have approximately the same amount of activity on both sides. On that basis, then, we can make a prediction. Well, you know what? We're going to see, we're going to have the same type of granularity of activities to manage. Therefore, we're going to see approximately the same numbers of people, same types of tools. We're going to have well-defined processes, and approximately the same budget. And indeed, that is what you see. Good way to compare different governance systems between organizations. Very few are willing to tell you exactly how they do stuff. Go into places like LinkedIn, you can make comparisons. You know, people with their profiles are very organizations, you can define it. And indeed, that's what you tend to see. So, that's a very useful feature of website scale that allows you to make those comparisons between organizations that might otherwise seem quite different. Okay, that's the framework um, of web governance. Now we're going to talk about uh, the analytics of governance. Before we do, I forgot about this slide and the next one. <laughs> How do you use that framework? Well, it really depends where you are in terms of your web governance journey. Let me like to think about web governance and how people approach the challenge of online management in terms of the three steps. So we have discover, organize, and optimize. Kind of discover is where you use, like I was 10 years ago with ESP, that utility, you know, like, oh my God, how do I do this? There's so many things to manage. How do I put order on this? How do I identify all the things I need to do to manage this website? and all the things I need to invest in to make it happen, and then how do I manage them over time? <clears throat> a lot of people spend a lot of time here trying to put a framework on stuff, trying to define teams, making sure everything you need to look after is, is in your role of responsibility, you know, sorting structures out and sorting out leadership, stuff like that. So a lot of people spend a lot of time there. But eventually you kind of get to the point where you go, okay, I kind of understand everything I'm supposed to be looking at now, and I kind of have the people that I need, now I want to do it properly. So I want to start investing in skills, I want to start investing in tools, I want to start making sure our processes are, are up to the task. <coughs> so a lot of organizations currently are here, that is, 
after a very long period of historic um, inattention to web governance, many organizations, maybe after 10 years of investing in, lot, in online and solving a lot of problems like design, content, marketing, kind of accessibility, I'm not going to say that they're all completely solved, but people kind of get the fundamentals of those now, and they understand them. If they invest in usability or they invest in uh, content marketing, they kind of know what they're getting out of it. <clears throat> now they're looking at the investment itself and saying, well, God, spend all this money and we spent all that money over the last 10 years, we better make sure from now on we've got a good return on it. And therefore, web governance as a discipline is starting to come to the fore. <clears throat> so, a lot of people are there at the moment. And the hope is that after spending some time organizing and getting everything in place, you achieve a scenario where your web governance system is stable. It's giving you a secure foundation so you can say, okay, look, at least I know that I have kind of white people I need. But with good skills and they're carrying their basic activity to a good level, but now I can focus on the importance of my online goals. Because I don't have to worry about you know, people squabbling in my team because the roles are well defined. I don't have to worry that you know, if a guy who's off sick and then somebody else comes in to do his job, that he's going to do it uh, right because I have a well defined process in place. I don't have to worry about leadership because I have a you know, senior executive on my side. So it kind of gives you the stability that you're looking for. You can say, all right, I can focus on my online goals. And I can start to manage my uh, governance itself better by trying to get bigger bang from my book that uh, is stretching, stretching my dollar, basically getting better return on investment that we're putting into online for my organization. Uh, just this new peer reorganized might be that you know once you have got to a level of stability, then it sort of comes lying, kicks the door down and says, Hey, we're merging with our you know our competitor for whatever, you know, some of your web teams are together, it's a completely new strategy. So you know, oftentimes you might have to reorganize. That is, you know, we bring on completely new skill sets because they're doing something we've never done before, etc. But you know, the ideal path is one, two, three. So depending on where you are on that, um, good thing to use the web governance framework for is just to make sure you're covering all the activities and resources you should be. So again, no matter what the scale of your site and no matter what your site is about, those four activities and all those subtasks, you should be doing them. If you're not doing them, there's potential risk there. Secondly, if you're kind of more stable and you're thinking, okay, I kind of understand all that, um, and you want to make changes to a government system, you can use the framework because it is relatively straightforward as a means or as a communication support. Say, hey guys, I'm thinking about changing your governance because you know we have to do these activities and we need to invest in these things on the current system we have in place aren't appropriate. And you just use that simple diagrams that everybody can work off. And then thirdly, if you are more stable, you can start to use the framework both to maintain that stability if you ever need to be organized, and also to optimize for better or why. And a good way of doing that is by using the analytics, the emerging analytics of web governance. So like I said, over the last number of years, well, um, uh, the scale of many operations has kind of grown from small scale to large scale because of the historic inattention to online management, many organizations. The web governance systems in place, particularly leadership, also definition of roles and responsibilities, but also tools, haven't kept pace with that. So a lot of web managers who started out managing a small scale website found themselves gradually getting further and further back from online operations because of bringing more people on and they're starting to look after tasks. But a lot of those tasks have been done manually simply because the tools haven't been there to help you do them. Okay? But that is changing because all those Tasks, so tasks we saw of online management, a lot of those are starting to be automated, whether just for labor saving, like a very simple one, which is QA, and make sure you don't really make no misspellings. I mean, I've done all of those myself manually in the past, so I used to ESB set aside Friday morning, nice and quiet, just be a cup of coffee, three hours, check every link on the website. What a waste of time, okay? Um, Okay, helping maintain quality. It wasn't a very effective use of a very highly paid, sophisticated executive. <laughs> uh, so rather, it's you know, it's better to get a piece of software to do that for you. And there's other tools coming online to help you develop other areas. And then also tools to help you with supporting manual activity or helping with decision support. And that's what web governance analytics is about. Using those tools and the data that they're collecting whilst they're doing all these complex tasks. Kind of putting it together and seeing what it's telling you. And in that regard, it's, it's very useful and, and important to remember the web governance that it's not an end in itself, but rather a means to an end. <clears throat> I described already how you know when you have confidence that you're kind of stable in web governance, so you've got a you know a secure foundation and things are kind of coasting on. I kind of think I have the people that I need now, and yeah, I finally been able to convince my senior management to give the give me the budget I need and 
Yeah, the processes are good, the tools are good, and people are kind of getting on with each other finally. Like now, people I can start focusing on my, my own run objectives. <clears throat> and that's really what web governance is about. It's not really about pursuing online goals, which is you know, kind of why we're online. Um, but it's about securing, ensuring the secure foundation is in place to allow the organization to achieve those goals. Many web managers, and perhaps over time we'll see this more, is that uh, kind of that distinction between marketing and management may emerge, where marketing is really about, well, I want to do all the really you know, uh, cool stuff about you know, pursuing new audiences and all that, but who's going to look after the ship in the meantime? You know, just to make sure that yeah, everything's happening, the decks are swabbed or whatever it is. But I'm going to abandon the boat metaphor because I'm using a car metaphor instead here to <laughs> confuse people. Uh, used a way to think of that web governance is like a well tuned engine of a car. When you invest in a car, you're not investing that you want to, you know, you're opening the hood every day and go, oh my god, the amazing engine is just, you know, twerk, tweaking this and tweaking that. No, you invest in a vehicle for the open road to bring you from A to B as quickly as you can. You don't want to worry about the engine under, under the hood <clears throat> or the bonnet. Um, sure, you need to make sure it's well tuned, you bring it for servicing, it's topped up with oil, but that's not why you have the vehicle. It's the same thing with web governance. <clears throat> you invest in online, not so you can be resolving interpersonal differences between your, your team members or you know, writing processes all the time because people are at each other's throats. No, you invest in online because as long as they're providing to your organization. You need an engine in place, you need a team or a web governance system to help you get there. That's not when you do it. <clears throat> <clears throat> and just like an engine of a car that's well tuned, has a number of features that you can define, so it's top of the oil or it's carbon, I don't mind even a car, so you know, good engine, you know, I'm sure an engineer can define for you. In the same way you can define a well tuned governance system as well. <clears throat> and there's five basic features. I mentioned some of these already. So the first is that all four activities and all their subtasks are being covered. So there's no gaps. So let's say if you go into an organization, I do this a fair amount, so they have a problem with their web governance. The first thing I do is I measure website scale. I say, well, look, tell me, um, tell me what your architecture is like, what the complex is like, uh, how many people are on your team, how many, you know, why there's the content or amount of effort that goes into content production, what is that about? And then also activity, you know, what's the scale of engagement. I say, okay, well, now I kind of understand how big you are. <clears throat> right, get all the activities, because if I've got a large scale site, after looking at scale, like, this is a big, this is a big scale site, you can do a lot of stuff. That means all these four activities are highly granular. So I expect to see that every activity is named with a person's name next to it. Okay? And if I go in and I see, well, QA isn't being done or nobody's named to do feedback, monitoring, or online engagement, uh, or nobody's there to look at the change control or ensure the stability of the architecture, their gaps and their risks. So that's the first thing I do. So make sure all the activities being done and to the right level of granularity. Secondly, make sure you get the right numbers of people to do the level of activity expected, and they've got the right skills in the appropriate teams, um, and with the right roles. So well-defined roles is kind of like good fences, good neighbors, you want your staff to go on. Write, write it down. Um, of course, it's more difficult when you're going back to a team that's maybe grown organically over years. Uh, a way to address that, I mean, the, the extreme way to address that is to fire everybody and hire everybody. You know, it's a horrible way to do it. A better way is to just help people to write their own descriptions and then massage you to whatever works best. Next one then is ensure rigorous reproducible processes that mirror consistently. So that the idea is that no matter who's involved, this is real QA quality assurance. So no matter who's doing the process, they all follow the same process. So no matter if John and he goes off and sick and somebody's taking his job and go, ah oh, wait, well, here's the process work, this is what he needs to do. <coughs> Tools, so we're using the correct resource tools that are being used appropriately. Correct resource means, of course, you're not using correct software, which is important to use for home scale. And then finally, the budget in place that supports that investment because it supports your ambition for online scale. So they're the attributes of a well defined, stable governance system. <clears throat> now, the analytics of web governance is about telling you, giving you an early warning system if something is going wrong somewhere in there. So, again, going back to the analogy of the car, the engine of the car. Um, you know, you don't go in and pop the hood every day and go, what, everything looks okay, right, let's take the road. No, you just jump in and then you rely on the dashboard of indicators, okay, the engine, or oh, what, let's see the red oil lamp going on, maybe we should pull over and check that out. It's the same with the uh, analytics of web governance. Kind of like an early warning system or a dashboard of indicators to tell you something potentially might be going wrong here, maybe you should start checking it out, or then your web governance to see something different. 
sort of the three sets of indicators that we look at um, to ensure the health of the web governance system. So there's online, operational, and organization. And for each of those, what you're trying to track is that you've got a basic minimum level of quality in place for each of them. Things are happening as they should happen. There's no unexpected errors. Things aren't going down. Online is basically that you're delivering a good, decent quality level of online experience to your users. Operations, you're giving a good level of experience or service to your internal stakeholders. The third, the people who maybe come to you and uh, commission work from you, produce significant products of content or, or a new design or whatever it is. And then finally, organizational, which are kind of like project management indicators. So an organization might say, okay, well, we're investing this in that team. Let's say a bricks and mortar store, what return are we getting from that? Are the staff happy? Are we seeing a high staff turnover, which could be indicative that things aren't all well and within the team? So let's look at those in detail. And we're going into quantitative and qualitative. <coughs> quantitative ones for online are, again, it's not saying that are we hitting our goals, it's more about are we providing basic minimum levels where everything's good, so I can be happy that this site is delivering good level of quality, and then I can use that and say, right, um, now the things I really want to focus on are whatever. So I was using an example yesterday of, you know, maybe you sell, I don't know, or you're responsible for dog licenses, why it comes with a dog license. It doesn't matter, your content with dog license doesn't have to be the world's greatest article ever written about dog license. It's just to tell you exactly what to do. Now if your business is selling dog licenses, okay, well maybe you really want to put some extra super effort into that. But basically what you're looking for is a Kind of readable, there's no misspellings, there's no other links, uh, all the everything has been marked up correctly and it's semantically organized. Basic level is there, and then you get like a content expert in to say, oh no, right, this is good, but I'm going to make it even better. <clears throat> so there are quantitative things. So you can measure those for every activity and every subtask within the four activities here. Qualitative feedback or qualitative measures are oh, what are your users saying about the content experience. Same for operational. So Quantitative measures is somebody comes to you with a project and say, well, how quickly do you respond to that project request and deliver, give them the deliverables? What quality are you doing that? Is it a good cost? And what's their level of satisfaction? Are they saying, yeah, they respond well to my request, they're good to get on with, everything's documented, everything's reproducible, if I, if I go back to them again, they, they deliver the same level of quality. And then finally, at the highest level for the organization, so worldwide would be the most important measure. Then we have risk, so is my team operating this team here is operating well, it's not doing kind of dodgy practices like black hat SEO or something and put my putting my business at risk. Like I think example here is going from BMW <clears throat> and then staff retention. Does it look like people like working here? If it doesn't look like working here, like working here, that's indicative that there maybe there's problems within the team. So let's take an example, just one example, like you could use any task, we're going to take the content task here. So what you'd be looking for is the basic level of quality. You get I have articles on my website, I check all, all the articles um, using the tools of, um, of web governance, which we'll look at in the next slide. So it's saying, yeah, everything's 100% error free, high level of readability, good SEO, you know, all the tools say, yeah, you know, the markup is all there, all the metadata is all there, <clears throat> and qualitative feedback from my users is why this is good content, you know, good low numbers of ratings and shares on Facebook and whatever else it is. The people I do, upon whose work, on, upon whose behalf I do the work, they say, yeah, they deliver on time, it's good quality, and it's affordable, and hey, it's really easy to work with. But finally, yeah, my staff are happy to work here, it's low risk, good or away, and, you know, getting this good feedback thing is a really good place to work. <clears throat> Where does that data come from then? So these are the emerging tools that we're seeing. So obviously, Site Improve do some of this. So they do QA checking, so broken links, misspellings, and they do, uh, uh, technical uh, site availability, so it'll tell you when the site is down. And there's other tools that do things like web readability, which will scan everything and tell you, you know, what grade of reading it's suitable for. We have web analytics, of course, and SEO tools, which um, review the quality of, of, of SEO. We have a CMS tool, obviously, which tells you who is publishing rights and hopefully when they're publishing and how many pages are publishing and how many new pages are created and how they're changing the information architecture and other stuff. Maybe a basic project or a high level project management stuff would say, well, I've set, you know, John five tasks for the next week. Is he completing those tasks? Is he not completing those tasks? Both tracking, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's too many this here. And in fact, it's, you know, it's, this is ongoing. This isn't well defined yet. There's a lot of these emerging all the time. I'm writing a lot about this at the moment on my website, which is different.com. So if you really want to keep up with it, it's probably best to go there. Um, 
So there are some of the sources of the analytics. And then it's when these indicators or when the analytics the data from these systems says, oh, something might be amiss here. So at the beginning I mentioned, well, engagement is low. Uh, I'm seeing that from web analytics. Or maybe inside improved QA2 will go, uh, uh, you know, 25 misspellings on this page, you know, broken links all over the place. You go, well, something's wrong here. And that, that can indicate, well, perhaps, not definitely, but perhaps there's a problem with my web governance. Okay? It could be just a simple mistake. Okay? Or it could be indicative that, you know, don't have the right skill, don't have the right people, people are under pressure, publishing really crappy work because there's so many things to do. All right? So then, to sort that out, to identify if web governance is potentially default, you go through the following steps to audit if, uh, well, this is just an example of what a bad system might look like. So, uh, content again, so we might have lost errors, poor readability, missing metadata, bad qualitative feedback from users, <clears throat> your operational, uh, people you deliver operation on behalf of, and they say, well, you're doing late every time you give your project, it's really crappy work, it's expensive, hey, well, you give me this, say, well, very difficult to work with. And then, of course, you might see a high staff turnover, so hiring people constantly because people keep leaving, very costly, dodgy practices, and poor feedback. <clears throat> So then we follow the order process to see if web governance is involved. <clears throat> so the first step on the order trail is, I mentioned this already, is to make sure everything's been done. There's no gaps in the activity. So using content again as an example, if content goes live, a lot of misspellings, it's because QA isn't occurring. Um, if, if not, why not? Or if it's occurring, it's only been done on a cursory level. So loads of errors, broken links, perhaps QA isn't happening. <clears throat> Um, if it is happening, well, perhaps the staff member, perhaps the staff member responsible doesn't have enough time to do it, so they're really doing it really quickly um, because we're under so much pressure and a lot of other things to do, they're you know, doing it in enough detail. Or perhaps even the overall web manager has just overlooked that task, because that leadership has to say, okay, somebody needs to look after all those activities and all these subtasks, and they just forgot to tell somebody, hey, we need to do QA, make sure you do that every month. <clears throat> Um, otherwise, it could be perhaps the responsible staff member doesn't have the right skills and they don't QA before it, you know, you know what it is, and um, so they need to be trained up in it. Or maybe it's just somebody completely inappropriate to the role and they really resent having to do it. So, like a designer being told to do a no web analytics, they don't want to do that because they want the design over it. Thirdly, then you identify how each task is done and how rigorous it is. So, perhaps QA is occurring, but the staff member is ignoring the process. So that's a disciplinary issue, or perhaps the process itself isn't well defined. So you need to go into a little detail and say, well, check the tool and you know, double check manually, fix the issues, you know, record the issues, communicate whatever it is, so making sure that people know what they should be doing to follow through on, a, on an activity or a subtask. Uh, make sure you're giving your people the right tools to do the job. So this relates to particularly growth and scale. Um, a scale increases. Uh, we should be investing more in technology to uh, as a labor saving device, so people don't, you know, like myself, you know, checking things manually is not a great use of time. So, invest in tools that people can do more valuable tasks. Or perhaps people do have the right tools, but they're not configuring them in the right way, not using them in the right way. And then finally, obviously, you want to make sure that there's enough funds available to support all, that, all those resources and more tasks as well. So, that's the audit trail. <coughs> the diagnosis isn't always as simple as that. So, you might Drill back, so you might get the indicator that um, producing reading or the content that's going on the website is badly spelled, it's lots of errors, and you trace back and um, you're trying to pin down what the issue is. <clears throat> but you're not finding out um, an issue, or there's maybe some other indicator uh, that maybe you're getting a very high turnover of staff. So, despite the fact that you're producing really good quality content for the website and your web team is working well with internal customers, the web team, the team itself has seen a lot of churn. And that can indicate the four tasks that leadership is the person responsible for setting the tone of the web team, uh, making sure people know what their job is, and you know, setting appropriate levels of resourcing, i.e., so for all those activities to have no budget and people in place to do it. That whoever's responsible for setting that up here isn't doing their job. They're just putting too much pressure on people. So as a result, it's you know, like can work for a competitor down the road to get far better conditions and better pay. <clears throat> well, I've seen this myself on a, on a very significant approach that I did for a major bank. Um, where they did amazing work, incredibly good work, it worked really well with the internal stakeholders, IE and customers, but the project management of it was completely awful. So the team, every like six months, almost completely changed. That was indicative that 
the leadership within the coaching, the leadership of the West Coast system that is very, very poor because they're putting so much pressure on staff that just want to hang around. <coughs> So that's looking back at things that potentially are you know, a miss within a web governance system. But that's not the only thing we can use this data of web governance analytics for, but rather we can use it in a proactive way. And that's by taking data from many different sources, from web analytics, from the QA analytics that the site improve system it creates, and from other data sources, putting it together and looking for patterns, and then using those patterns to make better decision making in terms of allocation of resource. So, Here's an example of what that might look like. So let's say we have a website and we have two contractors who are both producing similar types of content, similar volumes, and we're both paying them the same, approximately the same for that service. Okay? They both have access to our CMS. So we say, okay, each of you over the next month produce 100 pages of content. After the month is over, um, so I know that they've published content, we can see their publishing patterns, like how often they were publishing and what pages they've created. I can go into GA to Google Analytics and see, okay, what's the traffic in those pages? What type of engagement? And you know, how well or how often are they being visited? I can look at for each individual contractor and say, okay, what's the quality of these pages? Uh, you know, which contractor is producing the best quality, the lowest quality, which is the broken links or making the spellings? Mm -hmm. I can look at engagement on both and say, okay, approximately similar types of content. So, but you know, this guy here is getting far better engagement, he's getting more traffic as we've seen, lower numbers of errors, and he's getting higher number of comments, greater numbers of ratings, people are sharing it more, retweeting it, they're reason to like it in terms of the comments. And then there's other sources as well. I just reproduced this one here from Go.uk, which uses lots of different data sources to produce quite quite interesting innovative um, graphics about how people are engaging with content. But you could have other data sources here. Like um, you know, the readability of content will be a good one. Uh, what other things could we have? We could have uh, that the project management side of things. So you set something to do list because you want to obviously manage your resourcing and how stuff is done in terms of timing. Maybe somebody of two contractors keep missing their their end dates and delivery dates for stuff. So you can put that data all together and then come to a decision, or you can come to an insight. You might say, well, look, I'm paying both of these people the same thing for approximately the same service. But this guy here is using really awful stuff. It's not being visited. And um, I can see by looking at CMS that they're only publishing haphazardly. They're throwing it all in on a Friday evening. Loads of errors. It's not being shared. I can see by my other readability tool, it's not meeting minimum standards that I set in terms of readability. I can see that they're not hitting their tasks in the project management system when I do it. <clears throat> Whereas this guy is doing all that, publishing really well, getting a lot of traffic, low errors, good engagement, high levels of readability, etc. So then you can say, oh, I'm going to convert my resource from this person to that person, I can't remember, and say, okay, well, that's going to be a better return on that investment. And if you imagine that's two companies providing similar service, you can see how the analytics of web governance can allow you to arrive at better decision making in terms of how you spend your budget and just about how you manage it overall. And part of the challenge is doing that or integrating all that insight for increasingly complex sites. Some of the best people to do it. Obviously, an organization. So, Go.uk, probably aware, have done some amazing work over the last number of years where they completely redeveloped how um, government services are provided. So, they rationalize a number of sites, you know, basically close a lot of ministerial sites and other agency sites and brought it together into this one kind of portal. <clears throat> and alongside that, what they've been doing is essentially publishing and explaining exactly what their approach is and how they're doing it, and publishing data along with it. And what that gives is an amazingly good insight about how good governance should operate. So these guys are really setting the standard in terms of governance at the moment. They're saying how it should be done. And organizations, as they grow on scale and start to look at Gov.uk and learn about them, learn the lessons of how governance should be done. Because they have said, we can't mess with governance anymore. If we're going to manage our websites effectively, if we're going to maintain a minimal level of quality and allow you know, our marketing or other people to focus on online goals, we have to make sure we have the right people in the following the processes well on goals and then we give them a budget to do it and plus really importantly we have executive support in place to make it happen because the most important initiative behind Go.uk is the minister has said I want this to happen and the prime minister has said as well I want this to happen and he's, he's really pushing it forward so whatever they want really they, they can get in terms of online delivery so that's really important it's, it's quite admirable to see what they're doing of course there's been difficult during the noise. <coughs> So in terms of what to do now, what you can take away from it, <clears throat> it really depends where you are 
on the journey. I think if you're stuck the first step of the journey, I mean, you're growing in scale, just look about it towards getting tools. You know, automate, there's tools out there, whether they're freeware or shareware, you know, automate stuff um, where appropriate. And second, you start to use the insight to <coughs> gather data, again, where appropriate, where you can. It's not easy a lot of the time because this is still as yet quite a nascent or emerging area, it's still quite young. <coughs> But if you get to a level of stability and say, well, okay, my people finally aren't each other at each other's throats anymore. It looks like things are kind of stable. Um, we have good processes. We seem to have the right budget and people in place. Look how you can start to use the data from these many different sources to do stuff better. <clears throat> and then and ask for organizations like Cyber Group, as I said yesterday, is more APIs, please. Because a lot of these tools don't talk to each other. I mean, the ideal situation would be is you log into your CMS. Pulls data in from site improves. Well, this page, yep, this is stuff going on here in terms of quality. Pulls the data in from the feedability tool, from the SEO tool, pulls in you know, the task, knows exactly who's creating pages, and makes the approach and that tool. So it puts it all together, makes this beautiful, wonderful dashboard, and also web analytics going in there as well. And that gives them an online manager or somebody looking after a large scale website, very sophisticated, with a lot of things going on, and where they're constantly kind of being pushed away and finding it harder and harder see the effect between the decisions they make and the impact on the website. The absence of tools and data is very hard to see that. But with something like this, using data from many different sources, you can start to break through that fog and actually reestablish that connection between the decisions and the That's it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>